Thank you, children. Amen. You know, it's uh, <laughs> the, facts of the, the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus sort of stand on their own as facts, really. You know, uh, they are what they are. But when you're thankful that those facts happened, when you're thankful that the truth of those facts have been applied to your life, that's the difference between somebody who just has some information and for somebody who's saved. One of the marks of the Christian is gratitude. Another of the marks of the Christian is joy. And when you can think on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it's easy to get mixed emotions. But some of those emotions ought to be thankfulness and joy. They ought to be there. Or else we haven't appropriated that. The Holy Spirit hasn't worked that into our lives like He needs to. So I thank, I thank the kids for reminding us, not just the facts, but we're so glad they happened. Let's pray before we turn to Psalm 49. Lord, we're grateful for Jesus. There's no way we would be in this room about to open your word expecting a thought from you unless Jesus. Lord, there's no way we would be willing to bend our knee to what we hear to change our minds without Jesus. There's no way that we would be willing to hear what we're about to hear and make decisions, actually change our lives as a result of what we're about to hear without Jesus. Jesus didn't just address our state of sin, though He did that. He also gave us ears to hear and follow in loving obedience Your Word. Lord, as we turn to Your, your Scriptures this morning, I would ask a couple things that You would help us Particularly help me, I pray, to represent what you've said here accurately to my friends. And I pray for them, Lord, that you would help them to hear what is truth from your word. That they would consider what you have written and consider how they might obey it. Lord, for all of us, I pray that we would have ears to hear and minds willing to make decisions to obey. Bend our will towards yours. Your will be done this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please turn with me to Psalm 49. Over these last couple weeks, we've been in the midst of our preparation for the resurrection. Pastor has started his series, in which he will rejoin next week. And it's been looking at the Old Testament and our expectation of Christ and how the Old Testament is setting a taste in our mouth for Christ. Psalm 49 is a part of that help. I want to tell you up front, though, before we start reading, this, this psalm's about death. And death is both serious and depressing depending on your perspective. But I want you to think about this as we read. There can't be a resurrection without a death. There can't be a resurrection without a death. Let's read together. Well, not together. You read silently. I'll read out loud. Psalm 49. But just out of respect, recognizing this is God's Word, could we please stand together as we do that? This is the Word of God. For the choir director, a psalm of the songs of Korah. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. Why should I fear in the days of adversity? 
when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me. Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly. And he should cease trying forever that he should live on eternally. That he should not undergo decay. For he sees that even wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names. But man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words. Selah. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for shield to consume, so that they have no habitation. But God will redeem my soul from the power of shield, for he has received me. Selah. Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Though, though while he lives, he congratulates himself, and though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. That is the word of God. You may be seated. This psalm really has about three parts. Verses 1 to 4 is an introduction that's going to, call us to cause us to listen, hopefully. Verses 5 through 12 show the common experience that we all have with death. And 13 through 20 show a contrast in that experience of death. This, this psalm was for the sons of Korah. It was for them to sing... Uh, you may, you may know that uh, in the temple of the Old Testament, the sons of Levi worked in the temple. One of the branches of that family were those who were Korah's sons and Korah's family, his, his small clan within the big tribe of Levi. And they had, among other responsibilities, musical responsibilities. They were to help out in worship, and part of that was they were to be uh, choirs and musicians. Well, there are 11 songs that are dedicated for the, songs of, for the sons of Korah, and this is one of the eleven. The introduction begins like this. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. He's calling us straight off, everybody, this is universally important, pay attention, hear, give an ear. Now, this is universally important. At this point, he's not talking to just the church. Everybody needs to hear this. And the reason is that, first of all, this is going to be about death. It's an important subject. The second is that people normally don't enjoy thinking about death or hearing about death. This is not going to be your favorite sermon this morning, I imagine, right? If you attend enough funerals, you will see that people haven't thought very much about death because at a funeral, every kind of crazy thought pops out of people's mouth, every kind of superstition, every kind of ridiculous statement about death is made at a funeral. And it's because we haven't thought about death. We haven't thought about the implications of death. And maybe that's why the psalmist has to start off like he does. Listen, pay attention, give me an ear. Because we'd really rather be thinking about something else this morning. I mean, we pay good money to people to keep death from us, don't we? Doctors. We pay people to distract us from the very truth that we're deteriorating. Entertainers, plastic surgeons, trainers, somebody. Help me remember I'm not falling apart here, right? (laughs) Distract me from my deterioration. We normally do what we can to stay away from this topic. And yet this psalm says all people, all kinds as well as every individual, is called to think about death and dying. Now this is hard to do. The thought of death actually scares people. And then there's the others of us who just generally want to avoid it. 
You know, I know of people who have not written their will or final medical instructions because they don't want to consider the end. They don't want to think what it might be like for them after that. They don't want to consider what this world might be like for their family without them. And so they unwisely put off thoughts about the end. Thoughts of death are disturbing. Even as I was thinking about this subject this week, I started thinking about you. Who's going to be hearing this? I have friends who are seriously ill. You do too. I have some friends who are seriously aging, <laughs> looking at the backside of life, so to speak. I wonder what they would think of this psalm. They don't want to think what might be right around the corner, perhaps. Then I thought about those in perfect health, maybe young people whom death seems so far down the line, they don't want to consider it. Particularly now, I mean, it's spring break, right? <laughs> Who wants to think about that? I thought about this being a, a week in which we don't have junior church. There are kids in here. Maybe the idea of death hasn't even really crossed their mind. Or perhaps you think about it a lot. Perhaps it's an overriding thought. Perhaps it's a preoccupation. Well, the psalm, call, psalm calls us to think on these things. And I would suggest maybe that's why you've been called here this morning. Verse 2 says that our social situation does not matter when it comes to this message. There is perfect democracy at the grave. It's for those on top of the world as well as those at the bottom. If you're in the in group and invited to parties and know the right people, you need to think about death. If you're at the bottom of the social situation, if you're friendless and ridiculed, made fun of, you need to think about death. Your economic situation does not matter. The message is for the rich or the poor. It doesn't matter if you have the best insurance or have no insurance or have no hospital to go to. You need to understand some things about death. Rich or poor, healthy or sick, male or female, black or white, native or foreign, whatever your age, death is an appropriate subject for your demographic, for my demographic. And we need to hear some things about it. The psalmist is saying the upcoming truth I need to share with everybody because it's like gravity. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. All experience it. The psalmist is about to tell us some truths so real, so significant, so unbending that both the prince and the pauper better listen. It's a message for everyone. Does he have your ear? Verse 3 says, My mouth will speak with wisdom and my, the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline, incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. If this is for everybody, you better come around and listen. This teacher is going to give a lesson for everyone. And he says, this is wisdom. If you want to be wise, huddle up and listen. Think through this one clearly. It's not just information, but it's how we ought to reorganize the way we think and decide and live. It changes how we think and our behavior. Are you ready to listen? Since the psalm has set the music, the musician himself says, I'm going to lean in and listen to what I'm playing. He wants to listen to the, to the lesson himself as well as give it to others. This tells me that the one who teaches ought to start by learning. The writer of the song, the choir who sings it, the preacher who preaches it, ought to lean in and listen. Does he have our ears? Verse 5 starts with the lesson itself. Why should I fear in days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surround me, even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches? Well, the lesson starts off with a question. A question about how we feel, how we think in times of adversity. The person has oppressors. They're powerful enemies. They're doing what they can. They have resources. But notice this question. He did not say, why do I have enemies? Nor does he say, how do I get away from these enemies? Nor does he say, why am I facing adversity? What he says is, why should I fear? Why am I anxious? 
Now, it's a rhetorical question, but one thought jumps to my mind. Mr. Psalmist, the reason you ought to be fearful is because of the circumstances. You have enemies. They have abilities. They're making decisions, carrying out actions, and it's working against you. That's why you ought to be concerned, worried, anxious. Verse 6 says, those who are in opposition have power and ability and rely on their wealth and authority. Let me, let me add, as you hear this, don't limit who those enemies might be. It doesn't rigidly mean that he's only speaking to people who have uh, enemies of a rich person. In other words, if I don't have a, a rich person as an enemy, he's not talking to me. He's already explained he's talking to all of us. You can suffer from all kinds of oppressors. The definition of an oppressor is anyone with power who does you harm. I would suggest we open up our thinking to who he might be considering. Rulers, bosses, spouses, parents, older siblings, elders, all can be oppressive if we live under their rule. Moreover, the idea of oppressor normally makes you think of an authoritative person who takes pleasure in doing you a harm. However, do you know you can be under oppression of someone who doesn't even have you in their thoughts? In other words, they don't know that they're hurting you. They don't know that their policies are hurting you or me. He or they may be, without malice, trying to protect the business, protect the family, protect the nation. They may be trying to protect the system that brought them into authority. They may be making decisions about cutting costs, cracking down on violence or drugs, raising taxes, raising grades, or making decisions based on something as personal as we just can't afford to have another baby at this time. Oppressors come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and they make decisions based on what's good for them, sometimes without even thinking about you and me. And you know how I know? because I have authority too, and that's sometimes how I use my authority. They may do this with malice or maybe not, whether they're thoughtless or an enemy violently against you. The point is the oppression is real. Those are the circumstances, and yet the psalmist who's considered the circumstances still asks the question, why should I be fearful? And in verse 7, he begins to lay out the answer, but it isn't what you think he might say. If the question is, why should I be fearful? Why should you be fearful? Here's the answer. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. Now, he wrote that like a poet. But if it was Cliff Notes... The bottom line is people can't live forever. That's the bottom line. People can't live forever. Which is a strange answer to the question, why should I fear? Why should I fear? Well, people can't live forever. That's why you shouldn't fear. That's why I shouldn't fear. Don't fear. Everyone dies. Everyone is challenged by a hard truth. The truth is death. God's going to take our soul from our body. And, and he says it here. Hey, rich man, with your money and your resources, liquidate everything you have, exercise all your authority, call in all your favors, and twist all the arms you can. You can't save yourself nor the ones you love from death. You can't. There's no escaping death. Did you know that the baseball great Ted Williams died and had an heir? And this heir had his father's head cryogenically frozen in Arizona. It's sitting there in Arizona. And though Ted Williams doesn't know it, he's waiting for the day when scientists find a cure for old age and he can be brought back to life. Listen. Bury Ted. <laughs> you can't buy your way out of this truth. Nobody has what it takes to buy back a soul from God. Verse 9 says you will decay until you die and then you will decay faster. Now the 
poet is being poetic, but he's also being obvious. You can't live forever. Death is a separation from body and soul, a separation of body and soul, and the moral decay, mortal decay of the body. Are you going to be able to keep that from happening? No. Stop trying. Here's the reason. God's not going to let it happen. He won't. Listen to this. God does not want this to happen because death is now God's tool. Okay? Now think about that. Death is God's tool. Death was not the original design of creation. Mankind was to be eternal, both body and soul, in Eden. Life was designed to be everlasting, as our great-grandparents had access to two trees, not just the one that was the knowledge of sin, but also the tree of life. They were to eat off that tree and to live eternally in the state they were in. However, they ate disobediently from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a new era came, and one in which death was introduced by their actions. But turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, please. When you read Genesis chapter 3, we tend to, to concentrate on the first part and the middle part, but there's, there's another part after that. In Genesis 3, we have several things happening. First of all, they actually commit the sin that brings in death at the beginning of the chapter. It records the initial tragedy of mankind. Adam and Eve's fall happened at the beginning of the chapter. And then from verses 7 through 21, you see both the guilt and the punishment and, and the, the extent of the fall, the ramifications of what they did. And really, this can't be overemphasized. However, there's a last section of the chapter from verse 22 that goes like this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has, come, has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he may stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, that's the situation. You get it? Adam and Eve have eaten. Sin has fallen on the creation. And yet there's still one more problem. What happens if they start or continue to eat from the tree of life? What happens? They live forever. Now that's a problem. That's a problem. Man and woman have now known and experienced sin, are now living in its aftermath. After they ate, sin produced guilt, it produced punishment, it produced toil, it produced broken relationships, the fall of the earth, and death. Spiritual death. And it happens in such a magnitude that you and I can't overemphasize that if we talked about it all day long. It was, it was just monstrous what happened. And the problem is, though man and woman were supposed to live forever, they weren't supposed to live forever like that. Yeah. Not like that. And if they continue to eat from the tree of life, they may live forever. God ultimately is going to fix this situation with the perfect work of Jesus Christ. However, verse 23, he begins to address the problem, limiting the damage. Verse 23, therefore... The Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and out of the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. God decided to take eternity in this state away from them. The reason we can't escape death is because God made sure that once it was introduced by sin, death was going to be applied across the board, and it was for our good. Now, did you see that? That was some kind of God jujitsu or something. Something that was designed to hurt us. He turns around and limits sin by using it against sin. Death and sin are partners. And yet God turns death to fight sin. Mm -hmm. 
By cutting off access to the tree of life, people no longer have the means of an everlasting life on earth. Death actually retards your ability to sin. How much sin would you do if you live forever? Yeah. Boggles the mind, doesn't it? Now, I know you don't understand this completely because your jaws aren't dropping yet like they need to. (laughs) This is important to understand. The principle behind this is God says it's better to die. It's better to die than to live forever when forever means living in a creation, in a body, in relationships that are ravaged by sin. See, you only have to live in this sin-contorted world for about 75, 80 years, 90 years, if things go the way you want it to. That's a blessing. That's a blessing that's only that long. Death constrains sin. Think about the principle behind this. Okay, here's the principle. Death is better than sin. Death is better than sin. If you thought about the implications of that, it would solve a lot of your ethical dilemmas, right? Would you steal to feed your family? Death is better than sin. Is lying all right to keep from hurting anyone? Death is better than sin. It's not the sum of all ethics ethical principles, but it's a good place to start. God preferred to end everlasting life in a sinful condition, in a sinful environment. Nobody works around this principle of death because God would rather us to be dead than for his creation to have a greater evil of eternal, perpetual, sinful existence. That would be worse. For those of us who think about sin and death the way God does, we ought to see death as an end to both our personal sinful habits as well as our existence in a sin-tainted world marked with pain and corruption. Haven't you ever, I mean this happens weekly, I know know it happens weekly, it happens weekly to me. Isn't, Isn't every week there a story in the news that makes you shake your head and say, what have we become? What are we? Haven't you ever asked yourself about your own behavior, about your own thoughts, about your own actions, about your own relationship? Haven't you ever said, again? Again? Can I really be this weak, this foul, this unfaithful to God? Again? The same way? Don't you look for the day where you'll stop disappointing God and yourself? Don't you look for something different from all this? For the faithful, death is preferred to sin. Once man was in a sinful condition, God actually used death as a strange mercy, didn't he? It's strange, but it's a mercy. So we didn't have to stay there forever. But the psalmist goes on, not only can men not live forever, forever, neither can their legacy Verse 10 says, For he sees that even wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names, but man in his pomp will not endure. He's like the beasts that perish. As people get older, some of you know this, some of you are about to know it as you, as you get older, as you hopefully get older, I guess that we start to ask questions not about ourselves, but what we leave behind. In other words, if we can't live on, then perhaps we'll leave our mark, right? The fool says, if I won't live, then what my life is about will remain. My inheritance that I bequeath will mean something. My legacy, right? This, this sort of thinking makes me laugh a little. I, I, I do two things with most of my time, pastor and history teacher. So I've been around a lot of dead people. I've been around the freshly dead and the long-term dead. 
And I've seen instances of inheritances that were stolen, trusts that were broken, money squandered, heirs feuding, families breaking. Money that could have been fed dozens for a lifetime has fallen into another man's hands and it slips away doing no good at all. Legacies and namesakes are eventually lost. If you think people are going to remember you, teach history for a while. <laughs> See what your students know about the famous people, <laughs> much less you and me, right? I, I teach people all the time, don't know the story about the pictures on the money they spend. Really, right? Legacies and namesakes are eventually lost. They have called the lands after their own names, but man and his pomp will not endure. Did you know once there was a town in Georgia that had a funny name? And the people in that town, did, they wanted to change their name. It was a growing community. They wanted to change the name. They looked around for somebody to name it after. And there was a very, very important man. He had accomplished a lot. His name was Wilson Lumpkin. And so the town went up to Wilson Lumpkin and said, we would like to rename our town after you. And Wilson Lumpkin said, no, I don't want you to name my town. This is a very nice thing to consider, but I don't want the town named after me. He said, would you consider this? You're honoring me because you think highly of me. Would you consider naming it after somebody I admire? Would you mind naming it after my daughter? And so the people thought about it, and they were like, sure. Anything beats the name we got now. And so they named it after Wilson Lumpkin's daughter, Martha. Now, I say that because you're in Georgia, and I doubt 99% of us know what William Lumpkin ever did in Georgia. And I bet 100 of us don't know one thing his daughter Martha did. <laughs> Georgia just couldn't tell you a thing about Martha. Nor do you ever recall going through Marthasville, Georgia, which before that was called Terminus, Georgia, which you and I call Atlanta now. So much for William and Martha's legacy, right? <laughs> Great men fade, and the people they admire, they fade too. And they call the towns after their own names, and then that fades as well. Man in his pomp will not endure. You know, after you die, you leave your legacy in the hands of somebody else. Somebody else. Those people are not going to think about your legacy the way you do, believe me. Your legacy is not yours. We leave our wealth and reputations to others. And while this has been universally troubling up to verse 13, we see some distinctions being made after that. Verse 13 said, This is the way of those who are foolish and those after them who approve of their words. Selah. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so that they have no habitation. Now it's true everybody's going to die, and it was clear from the, what was previously said that there's not going to be an exception. However, there is a difference here, apparently, between the fool and the upright. Both are going to die, but there's a distinction. In verse 13, the psalmist says, Let me depict the foolish and those who approve of the foolish. And in verse 14, he paints the picture. It says, The foolish are the sheep. Now, normally when the Bible calls somebody a sheep, it's not trying to say they're stupid. It's trying to say they're vulnerable, normally. In this case, it's saying they're stupid. This is the exception. It's a description that these people are unaware of the dangerous situation they're in. They're, they're existing in a state that they're not aware of. Let me clarify a couple ideas in here. Death is man's enemy, just as sin is. That's how the Bible portrays it. Death and sin are men, men's enemy, mankind's enemy. Death is seen to be a spiritual reality that threatens men. Secondly, shield was a fairly general Hebrew term for the end of this life. Literally, it means the grave. 
But figuratively, how it's normally used, it just means everything dealing with death. Dying. Being dead. The grave. So here you have this picture of this person who is personified, or not personified, he's, he's, he's depicted as a, as a sheep, part of a flock. And, and you have death personified as a shepherd. And what you have is the shepherd, death, walking his flock towards the grave. And they're just walking along, following the leader, walking towards the graves. They're fools and they're approving of foolish opinions. But verse 14 has a contrast when he says, the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Now, I'm going to tell you, this contrast comes out of nowhere. This is the first positive thing that's been said. It's a contrast with the previous group. Both groups are going to die, but death means different things to each group. The life gives way to a new morning in which the upright will rule. Now, it's not explained here. What does he mean by rule? What is, where's the rule for the upright? Well, this new idea of hope isn't explained in this psalm. But it is exploded in the New Testament where the righteous are going to rule with Christ. 1 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure, we will also reign with Him. Revelation 5, 9 through 10 says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The righteous are in Christ on that last day going to reign. His victory is ours. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says Christ will wrap up all of history with a great victory over all opposition. Previous in that same chapter, it says this, this is for the righteous as well. For as in Adam all men die, so all, so all in Christ will be made alive. Verse 25 of that passage says he must reign and we with him. On the other hand, the grave is the only home for the fool. And their form shall be for Sheol to consume so that they have no habitation. This creates some mixed feelings. Remember, those who have been described as oppressors and fools are the people who are now called sheep. So you can't help but feel that this is justice being done and that they're getting what comes. And indeed, it will be perfect justice for them. However, on the other hand, there's no doubt that they are to be pitied and don't understand their own end. And so we as Christians are in an ironic position of wanting to stop evil and for evil to be judged, but feeling sorry that those that are our oppressors, in light of the very end they face, are walking into death, though they are our oppressors. But remember, it was our Lord who said of those who were killing him, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. These sheep are being sent to the grave, and they don't know what they're doing. Doesn't this answer the first question of verse 5? During times of oppression, why don't I fear under the thumb of the oppressor? One reason is, he's being shepherded to the grave. His rule is temporary. His ability to harm has limits. He will weaken, he will decay, and he will die. But it cuts the other way. The truth cuts the other way too. Why don't I fear under the th thumb of the oppressor? Because the righteous will die as well. Only here, this is a dark night in which they wake up in the morning with the breaking of a new day in which the upright in Christ will rule. Paul says, Paul says what, do you, what, what can you do? What can you do to someone who is loved by God? What can you do to hurt that person? How do you damage a person that's loved by God? Can you separate them from the love of Christ? No, you can't. Will tribulation or persecution do it? 
No. Well, what about death? Paul says, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We're considered to be sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers of height or depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Why don't I fear? It's because I get to die. I get to die. Not only is my oppressor dying, I'm dying. No wonder the psalmist says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Verse 7 and 8 says it was impossible for you to redeem your own life or even anybody you love, your brothers. And yet here it says, God will redeem my soul from the power of death. Apparently the cost of a soul is much, much more expensive than any man could ever afford, but the blood of Christ will buy it. The blood of Christ can get it. That's the love from which we can't be separated. God's redemption can overcome the power of death. Now, this is funny. We saw that God used death, our enemy, against sin, our other enemy. But Jesus takes it a step further. What Christ has done is made death powerless. It's powerless for those in Christ. Death is no longer this frightful shade at the end of life. It's not a dark fear that can strike behind any alley. You don't have to watch both ways all the time like you used to. For the righteous, death is a doorway to something better. Amen. Close your eyes for last time here with us and open them with Jesus. No wonder we can ask death, where's your sting? How can you bother us? One writer put it, that in the death and resurrection of Christ, we have the death of death. The death of death. Death can't take what is ultimately valuable from us, and it is the passageway to that which is ultimately loved by us. It's a doorway that leads to better things. Verse 16 returns to the application of these ideas. Don't be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. Verse 5 asks, why be afraid? And this verse says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the rich and powerful, the well-known in this life. He's powerful and he seems glorious. We notice his earthly glory. Those with money and power and say so, we know what they look like. And it's hard not to stand in awe of these people and they know how to use their position. We tend to give honor to those whom honor is not due or inflate the good of what they do do. The rich man's jokes are always funny, aren't they? Aren't they? And so we find ourselves listening to athletes and actors telling us how to live our lives. We listen to politicians trying to define our ethics. Why? These people ought not inspire fear and awe in us. Verse 17 comes back to the refrain he mentioned before. Why is he saying it again? I assume because we need to hear it again. It says, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. <laughs> While he lives, he congratulates himself. And though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generations of his father. They will never see the light. Earthly glory is a temporary thing for all those who are rich and powerful and have abilities. It's temporary. And it'll fade on the earth as well as after death. Fame, celebrity, congratulations, they're all temporary, and history fades us all. And, and this is not unusual for those who will think about death. Even, even secular poets understand this. There was, there was a poet who, uh, there was this, uh, this Egyptian um, museum thing was coming through town, a, a showcase, and it was coming through town, and as it, it was coming, this poet just thought about it, and, and he started thinking about uh, ancient Egypt, he thought about the emperor that was there, he thought about the empire, the Egyptian empire, and he thought about the statue that this emperor